I'd like to show you the slowest computer I own. But I don't mean slow like an original 1981 IBM PC. And I don't mean slow like a 1982 ZX Spectrum. I don't even mean slow like the 1999 NetPliance eye opener. I mean slow like the 2007 Sony Vio TXN25. Now, what makes this the slowest computer I own? Does it have some awful Transmeta CPU, like Sony put in their wacky camera laptop six years earlier? No, it's a Core Solo, the same thing Apple shipped in the first Mac Mini. Ah, but it came with Windows Vista, so that's the problem, right? Well, no, I have machines that run Vista just fine, even on Atom CPUs, as long as they have enough RAM. So this one's RAM-starved, right? No, it has one and a half gigs. By all rights, this laptop should be perfectly cromulent, but let's just see how long it takes to boot. In case you weren't watching the clock, from power on to a program opening took nearly two minutes. That's the slowest boot time of any computer I've ever owned, no matter how old, no matter what hardware or operating system, and it's not even done. If we give it another two minutes, All this crap appears, and then something crashes, and now it's booted. It took over four minutes for this system to totally settle and be ready to use, and obviously that's absurd, but tragically, this was normal when this machine was new. Back in 2007, the computer industry had a problem, or more accurately, they had two of them, but only one was somebody else's fault, and both had the same effect, and that was computers booted really, really slowly. Now the problem that the vendors didn't cause was that Microsoft had released Windows Vista and that had upheaven the PC platform. Their previous offering, Windows XP, was truly ancient by 2007. It had come out six years earlier and even then it was pretty similar to Windows 2000 just with a new coat of paint. So basically, the most common operating system at the end of 2006 was one that had been designed to work, at least in a pinch, on a computer from the late 90s. A Pentium 3 500 megahertz would run XP, and not all that poorly, to be honest. Plus, it would do it in just 128 megs of RAM. Vista was not so happy under those constraints. I've heard a lot of theories about why many people didn't like Vista, and I think a lot of them are nonsense, but one undeniable fact is that it demanded more RAM. Now, most nerds probably weren't running machines with only 128 megs in 2007, but it was feasible. And if you were that person, then upgrading to Vista required eight times more RAM. Now, a gig didn't cost all that much, but the point is it was a big jump. And honestly, you really wanted two gigs, which was still a lot of memory at that time. So many people who upgraded from XP didn't add as much RAM as they needed, and system builders were reluctant to bump up their prices to offer more than the bare minimum. Acer, in particular, was actually shipping some Vista machines with the bare Microsoft-mandated minimum of 512 megs, which I can tell you would not have been usable. Vista was also just bigger than XP, and it was more complicated. There were a lot more little tiny files it had to load, and hard drives weren't very fast back then. SSDs weren't really a thing for most people yet, so almost everyone had spinning disks, and not even top of the line models. 7200 RPM drives existed, but 5400s were still pretty common, and laptops could be as slow as 4200. On top of that, spinning disks have seek times. That's the time it takes uh, for the disk to rotate around to a sector you need and for the head to swing over to the right track to read it. 
Now, almost nobody's had to deal with those for years at this point, but back then it was universal, and it meant that loading lots of little files, as required to boot your operating system, was a very inefficient process. Finally, while desktop CPUs were starting to get pretty good, even by modern standards, laptops were still struggling with single core 32-bit chips, and even worse, really compact machines often had ultra low voltage CPUs with effectively last generation performance. So Vista could be made to run well on not unreasonable hardware, but all these factors added up to a lot of machines being very sluggish, especially on initial boot. And even worse, if you bought a pre-built machine, the vendors did their best to make the situation worse. Every nerd has known forever. You do not use a computer with the software that it shipped with. We see it like eating a banana with the peel on. The OS that comes on a PC, not that any of us ever buy pre-built unless they're laptops, is basically shipping foam. It's there to keep the empty bits from rattling around on the hard drive, right? Or to prove the machine works or something. You don't use it. The first thing you do is wipe and reload with a clean OS. And we've always been right, and always for the same reason. System builders are not content with profit based on labor, markup, marketing expenses, and other normal operating costs. Like most businesses under modern capitalism, they want to make more money than they deserve for the work they've actually done. So, since time immemorial, like 1995, they've turned to other means of maximizing profits with no extra effort, namely the selling of ads. It's actually very funny that Microsoft waited until the last couple years to start putting outright banner ads in Windows because the rest of the industry has seen it as a billboard for decades. I mean, hell, Microsoft did it first. The initial release of Windows 95 shipped with an MSN ad right on the desktop. So it didn't take any time at all for PC vendors to up the ante. And here's the thing about selling ads on a computer. There's no limit. Uh, consider this. If you open any given magazine, a third of its content might be full page ads, and the rest of the pages are often partially ads, but that might add up to only 40% of the content. On a PC, you can ship more ads than usable software. It's free real estate. You can just keep ladling them on. And the natural endpoint is what you saw at the beginning of this video. This poor Sony laptop is crammed with garbage. There's obviously the big stupid software firewall from Norton that probably didn't do anything, and a Microsoft Office 60-day trial, both par for the course, but it also has special offers, and Napster, and Ask.com, and 22 other ads for Rock and Roll Jeopardy, for Da Vinci Code the Game, for QuickBooks, MOBA TV, the Adobe Store, and it has Corel Paint Shop Pro, Corel Snapfire, whatever that is, Weatherbug, X1 Desktop Search, and, and I can't decide which of these is weirder. Microsoft SQL Server on a consumer laptop? Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> or Microsoft Works, which was apparently still being sold in 2007, despite clearly having last been updated in 1995. <laughs> like, what's going on here? <laughs> and of course, a lot of this stuff is, is broken, straight from a factory restore, and thus working as it should have been when it was first unboxed. The Sprint sidebar widget displayed nothing but JavaScript undefined strings. No, it doesn't end. Undefined. Yes, this thing actually includes a custom Vista sidebar widget, which I've never seen before. And it's part of, what else? Another ad, some obnoxious Sprint wireless service tie-in that for whatever reason, Sony felt deserved to be integrated into another broken piece of software, a massively overwrought wireless switching app called SmartY that takes two minutes to start and then some internal component called third-party app manager immediately crashes. <laughs> Let me just reiterate, this is a factory load. I used the recovery partition that Sony shipped on the machine. So as far as I know, this is how it worked when it was first unboxed. I should also point out that the recovery took three hours, which I can prove because I streamed it in its entirety. Stream. No, it's just gonna be like me going like, wait, it's still installing? Wait, it's still installing? Wait, it's only 30% with a clock at the bottom. Okay, bio recovery tools, yeah, baby. I'm, I'm proud of myself actually. I have computered this hard before. Okay, so Vio Recovery has to finish, so let's push that aside. Let's bring back the Stinky. Huh, I got a Program Compatibility Assistant thing. 
saying a program didn't install correctly, but it's on the VIO uh, recovery partition. Huh. Yeah, the VIO is still, still doing it. I thought this was going to be super quick, or I thought I'd never even get the machine to do anything. I was just going to show you the stupid quick media mode and then continue. But uh, it's really funny that it has gone this entire stream, pretty much, uh, just churning away for no good reason. The VIO is, ha has another program that it thinks may not have installed correctly. So yeah, when the recovery process completes, this thing is too stupid to detect that on its own, so it tells you to do it. Maybe this thing will speed up after sysprep is done. I don't know. Like, this, this sucks. This is horrible. I'm going to push this back there. Let's do something we actually enjoy. Apparently, all that shit up until now, even though it got to a desktop twice, was not actually the oob. And only now, theoretically, are we using the computer. Oh my god! Really? Really? They basically, they embedded a goddamn product offer into the Windows setup process. It is now doing yet another phase of the oob. This is absolutely the slowest refresh process I've ever seen in my life. And you say, how is that possible? I've run Windows recoveries before. It takes like half an hour, 40 minutes at the outside. And yeah, that is how long it took for the disk to be imaged. But then it spent two and a half hours pre-installing all these programs somehow. I don't really understand how any of the bullshit that Sony heaped onto this pitiful little computer made it as slow as it is. I mean, surely all that crap isn't actually running at all times, right? The task manager doesn't look all that wild, but somehow it takes literally five or six seconds for anything to happen on this system, even after it's fully booted and settled. So Sony ruined this little computer. And that was typical for machines of this era. Vios were maybe the worst, but every company did it. And so, they were all panicking. They were selling under spec hardware, then loading it down with garbage, and since they sure as hell weren't gonna fix either of those problems, they needed some way to make users feel like their computers weren't a waste of money. Now, the biggest pain point in their eyes was probably boot times, and probably mostly for laptops. Desktop PCs, you can just leave running, so if you're upset at how long your PC takes to boot, just boot it once in the morning and leave it on. Laptops, however, are portable devices. They need to be turned on and off and on and off all the time. Now there's sleep mode, of course, but in the mid 2000s, sleep was not yet super reliable on the PC platform, so vendors couldn't bank on it. They had to assume that while you were out and about, you were turning your system on, doing a few things, and then shutting it all the way down. If you had to wait two to four minutes every single time, you might get pretty frustrated. So I think that boot times really were the biggest concern. Even as slow as this little Sony is, it's sort of moderately usable once it's started and the program's actually open. It was the booting that was really painful because you were doing absolutely nothing the whole time, just waiting. And plus, for that whole four minutes, it was pointlessly chewing up battery power. And that's another element to consider. I can't prove this, but I suspect that Vista ate battery faster than XP. It just had more processes running, like uh, super fetch and disk indexing, that if they were present in XP at all, were at least less aggressive. And I can't find hard numbers to back this up, but I did find an Anantec review stating that a MacBook Pro had almost half as much battery life when running Vista. And it's not just a matter of the OS not being optimized for the hardware or something, because a Lenovo with comparable specs had about the same runtime. So Vista seems at least more power hungry than Mac OS X. It's probably not insignificant that OS X is a Unix derivative, but we'll talk about that later. So what did system vendors do to deal with the extreme slowness of early Vista PCs? Well, mostly nothing. Computing just sucked for a few years, but there were some that attempted to offer a solution. As a system builder, you can't fix Windows and you can't improve the hardware. You can't really do anything. PC builders don't really make anything functional. They just glue other people's stuff together. So they had to find something they could glue to a PC to make it somehow faster. And this VIO shipped with one of those things. Right now, this machine is powered off completely. It's not on standby or hibernate or anything like that. And I wanna point out that along the bottom of the screen, there's this row of media playback controls, you know, play, stop, back, next, etc. Like you'd see on a lot of laptops in this era, keyboards, etc. 
But to the left of those is this button that says AV mode. And if I press that, the machine powers on. Now let's count it off. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and there we go. Just like that, we're sitting at some kind of interface. And <laughs> whatever it is, we got to it in 12 seconds instead of 150. So this is a massive improvement over Vista's boot time. But what exactly have we booted? Well, if it looks like the interface for a DVD player, that's because it is. Uh, Sony often called this instant mode in their documentation, but the button is just labeled AV mode because that's literally all it does. It's for playing audio and video. Uh, see, if I select the first option here, we get a disc player interface. Uh, this laptop, I should mention, is one of the smallest that I've ever seen that actually has a built-in optical drive. So we'll just get ourselves a DVD here. Oh, that is really flimsy. I, I hate pushing on that. That sucks. Anyway, all right, it recognizes it as a DVD, and now it's playing, just like any DVD player. Uh, it's got the little screen on here to just tell you what options are available. I think you hide that with F1, but it works just like any other DVD player. There's no point even giving a tour. It is exactly the same as every DVD player ever made. There's literally nothing to discuss. And if I put an audio CD in here, it would play that too, except then I'd get content ID'd. And I will explain why this looks exactly like any other DVD player ever made in a few minutes, but let's keep moving. If we hit the AV mode button, we go back to the menu here, and the only options besides power off and start windows are a photo viewer. And if you wanna know what that does, buddy, you're in for a big surprise. It's an image viewer, and it can only display images from memory stick or SD card. Uh, it can't read USB, it can't read the hard drive, and all it can do is display photos. You come in here, you pick one, it takes an incredibly long time to load it, and then you can do a slideshow, you can step forward, and you can step back. And that's all it can do. It won't play videos, it won't play MP3s, it won't do anything else. Now, to be just the tiniest bit charitable, in 2007, this was pretty cool functionality. Streaming was almost non-existent at the time, and DVDs were the primary way that people watched movies. Now, the original battery life of this machine, according to review, was about four and a half hours. So you could take this tiny device camping, it's only a little bit bigger than a DVD, and you could watch two and a half movies on this without needing shore power or internet. And that was something people did back then, and that was pretty cool. But if you're about to spend several hours watching movies, why do you care if it takes two minutes to boot? You can cook s'mores or something while you wait. Uh, the machine also came with a DVD player app that runs in Windows, and according to reviews, it even got slightly better battery life. So, our questions are as follows. What the hell is this? How does it work? And who is it for? And the answers are typical, boring, and nobody. But this just sets the stage for the theme of this video, or series of videos, actually. I am calling this a new show, because what began as me asking similar questions about a machine I owned over a decade ago led to a deep rabbit hole, which I know I haven't fully explored yet, with many branching paths that loop back on themselves. It turns out there was an entire cottage industry built around this slow boot problem, which almost nobody noticed existed, and it lasted a lot longer than you'd expect. By some measures, it ran into the mid-2010s. At least a half dozen companies produced instant-on solutions that tried to solve the problem of Vista booting slowly by not booting Vista at all. That is, of course, what's going on here. This machine is dual booting. I've investigated what it's dual booting, and you won't be surprised. To save us a lot of time, yes, people in the audience going, if it's so slow, I would have just put Linux on it. That's exactly what they did. This is, of course, Linux. What else would it be? Let me show you. All right, so we've booted back into Windows. We've waited for all the shitware to open and then closed it all. And I'm just gonna open a copy of Explorer here. We're gonna go to C drive. We're gonna enable show hidden files and folders. And look at that, a folder called instant on. 
Now, if we open it, we just see a bunch of files with no extensions and cryptic names, so it's not much to go on there, but uh, this is the instant on environment. Let's swap this machine for one that's a little newer and we'll see what's inside those. This is my Lenovo X260 that I just picked up very used a couple weeks ago and I love it to death. Laptops should not be bigger than 13 inches. So I've copied off all the instant on files. These are them right here. And if we run the file command on one of these, let's try IVI FS for instance, it says that it is a Linux X2 file system. Uh, in other words, these are disk images. And those of you who were using Linux in the early 2000s will remember that there were distros that could be booted from inside Windows using a technique like this. There's an entire Linux operating system living inside this set of files on an NTFS partition. And that lets it coexist with Windows without having to repartition your hard drive, which was considered a lot riskier back then. It was also very convenient for trying out Linux in the era before live OSs were practical, and also for people who were really concerned about data loss. Now these files are really easy to extract, so I've done that. And we have a basic Linux root file system like you'd expect. We've got bin, etsy, etc. The most notable thing here is uh, in the bin folder, there's a copy of BusyBox, which is pretty typical uh, for very low resource Linux builds. Things like set-top boxes, routers, that sort of thing, where you've got extremely slow CPUs and very limited RAM. I don't know if this was based on some specific distribution or rolled from scratch, but if BusyBox is there, it's most likely been built by hand, and it doesn't really matter because Linux is Linux for any given era. Now, if we check out rc.local in the etsy directory, you can see that this thing is uh, very stripped down, so they're doing everything by hand. Uh, it has to mount all the disk images manually. It has to use Mod Probe to inject all the different drivers for the graphics card, for the DVD drive, for the sound card, uh, for the battery. Everything has to be loaded by hand, so you can tell this is a very stripped down Linux setup. Uh, anyway, if we get all the way down here past all that crap, we find this, uh, the command that actually launches the software once all that crap is set up. And it's called test UI, which makes me think that this was built by like three guys, which is supported by other things that we'll find. I mean, if you look in the folder here, obviously it's got uh, the skin files, uh, fonts for the app to use. It also has a bunch of support libraries. And then of course there's the app itself and then just some random C header files and a make file that made it into the shipping program somehow. So yeah, real professional hours here. Now of the libraries in this folder, some of them are open source like libfreetype, uh, but most of them are proprietary code, which you can tell because if we open one in a text editor and search for IVI, you can find there's a bunch of functions that begin with that prefix. And I happen to know what IVI stands for. See, while I was working on investigating this, I tarballed this entire file system so I could back it up, but instead of writing it to a USB drive, I accidentally overwrote the changelog file, and I figured that that might contain some juicy stuff, so I went digging through the recovery partition on the machine to try to get it back, and I ended up finding it inside a file called Instant Mode J, which turned out to be an installer with a non-rebranded splash screen, and from that, I learned that this is actually a product called InterVideo Instant On, or IVI. So, this is at the root of everything that I'll be talking about in this video series. Sony didn't write this software. System builders don't really make software. Even when Sony shipped systems with in-house apps, they were always made by some other division at the company. They're usually meant to be sold standalone or shipped with other products like media players or camcorders. Sony's PC division bought this operating system pre-made from another company. And that's universal to every instant boot OS I have found. They were always from some incredibly mediocre middleware vendor. In this case, that was InterVideo. The copyright dates on the splash screen suggest that Instant On has roots back to at least 2004, and that's very interesting because at that time, the Vista situation wasn't even on the horizon, so one wonders what problem they were trying to solve. But if we look up this name, we do find press releases from 2004 that indicate that that's when it first hit the market, although not as a standalone product. You couldn't go and buy Instant On in a box at a store. It was sold directly to OEMs to integrate into new PCs. And that makes sense. That's what InterVideo was all about. You might recall their name, in fact, from the very common DVD player software, WinDVD, which a lot of people had, but I don't think anybody ever bought on its own. 
I think you could buy it, but it mostly came with new machines and DVD drives and that sort of thing, so you never really had to. Well, it turns out that Instant On is based on the Linux port of that package, LinDVD. And I think that was never actually sold directly at all. They started selling it all the way back in 2002, but again, only to OEMs and primarily for integration into set-top boxes. Uh, that's a term that refers to things that literally sit on top of your TV or, well, in the modern era, sit under it. And in that era, and probably still today, it wasn't uncommon for standalone DVD players to run Linux under the hood. That's probably how Sony got involved with InterVideo to begin with. They'd been selling DVD players, probably based on LinDVD for years, so they had a sales relationship already. And thus the reason that Sony's AV mode looks just like every other DVD player is because it very likely is, literally, in no uncertain terms, the same software that was running on Sony's DVD players. Uh, LinDVD was actually certified to work on certain Linux distros that were intended for set-top boxes, one of which was MontaVista Linux, which is still around and is going to play a role in a later video in this series. This was a very small world. Everything's connected to everything else. But that story is going to require a lot more prep because it's a whole series of buckle-up moments. You see, I've always been on the hunt for PCs that do something other than power on, verify DMI pool data, and then boot Windows. Almost every PC story begins the same way. If you have a machine that looks like it has weird hardware features, they're always going to be something familiar just hidden behind a curtain. Any laptop with special buttons, for instance, they'll just turn out to send virtual keystrokes and a program running in Windows listens for them, that kind of thing. And it probably will be Windows, or at best, Linux. I said earlier that you won't be surprised to learn that this is just Linux because nobody has written a new bare metal operating system in decades. Yes, I know about Temple OS, please, shush. We know when we look at a PC that whatever's on the screen is just gonna be a program running under Windows or Linux or, or maybe Haiku. But I've always hoped to find the rare machine where pressing a button makes it start up and do something intrinsic, something that isn't just boot an operating system from a hard drive. It's a weird obsession of mine, but I finally found my holy grail and in the most unexpected place. In my hunt for every solution ever fielded for this slow booting problem, I learned that there were PCs that solved it by going way outside the bounds of normal computer behavior. I discovered some of the most fascinating and cursed software and hardware with names like Phoenix Hyperspace, Dell Latitude On, HP Quick Web, and Vidiace Instant Vidget sponsored by Boingo Wi-Fi. I found original hand-coded operating systems. I found subsidiary processors and electronic brain slugs. I found machines with two motherboards running different architectures. I found machines with two motherboards running the same architecture. The amount of passion and genius poured into this problem was unparalleled, except by how crappy the results were and how uninterested the public was in any of it. Nobody bought any of this shit on purpose. Nobody who had any of it cared, and it's all been completely forgotten but I'm digging it up so we can see one of the last gasps of truly original thought on the PC platform. But this ain't that. <laughs> what we have here is very straightforward. It's just a little baby Linux install with only one program so it can start real quick because it doesn't need to do anything. That's all it is. And I thought at first that the, uh, the AV mode button might be telling the system to boot from a hidden flash drive or something. No, it does no such thing. When you hit that button, it sets some flag in system memory that uh, tells the BIOS to load an NTFS file system driver and chain load into a Linux image. And I mean, that's a little weird, but only in an academic sense. I'm not sure where that NTFS support lives. Maybe it's built into the BIOS? That'd be pretty wild in the pre-EFI era, but it's not out of the question. Maybe they buried something in the MBR on the hard drive that bypasses Windows boot. I don't know. It's beyond my pay grade to find out. It doesn't really matter because other than what happens in the first second after the machine powers on, the rest of it is nothing special. Booting Linux from a disk image has been done a hundred different ways since time immemorial. That simplicity is probably why InterVideo was able to sell this as a turnkey product, and I think it explains why Sony's AV mode is such a bad product. 
Like I said, there just weren't many levers you could pull in 2007 to make a computer faster. I'm guessing that InterVideo, who already had a connection to Sony via their DVD player division, called them up and offered this program, and Sony, having the slow boot problem and no other solutions they were willing to accept for it, bought it in an act of desperation, even though it didn't really fix anything. I mean, sure, it boots faster than Vista, but that's it. It doesn't offer anything else. For instance, it doesn't improve battery life, and that seems wild, right? You'd think that since Vista had all this stuff going on, like disk indexing that was sucking up nearly a gig of RAM at idle, that a cut down Linux install with essentially zero background processes would surely consume less power. But like the review said, if anything, the battery dies a little bit faster in AV mode. Now, maybe that's because this was made by three guys. Uh, I did get the changelog file back from the installer, and if the words in brackets are names, then yeah, I think 90% of this was written by one dude. So maybe he did a bad job. Maybe his software is full of busy weights that tie up the CPU. And if this was made by a more serious developer, then it would do a better job. But I think it's more likely that the one thing you can do with this is just very resource intensive. If you're playing a DVD, then you're using the crappy little GMA 945 GPU to decode MPEG-2 data and scale it to the screen, and that's gonna be your primary power draw. I mean, sure, background processes could chew up extra battery by keeping the CPU busy, but Vista probably had optimizations to turn those off when media was playing. And besides, if you're not online, most of those processes are gonna run out of things to do after a few minutes anyway. So there's only so much improvement that could ever have been possible. And I'm not saying that extended battery life was a stated goal that Sony missed, it's just that it could have been, and it feels like a much better feature to aim for than a thing you could do under Windows, just with slightly improved boot times. I mean, what is that? Why would that appeal to anyone? Even the least computer savvy person is going to realize that once a movie's playing, it doesn't matter how long it took to get there. This is just nothing as a product. But if that very lightweight OS had contained anything else, like a word processor, an image editor, a calculator. I feel like it could have gotten better battery life, and Sony could have sold that a lot harder than what they had, but they couldn't buy that. Nobody was making it, and they weren't willing to put in the effort themselves. That's even more R&D, more actual labor dumped into a product line with probably very thin margins. The only thing that they could just buy was this silly little DVD player. And what else were they supposed to do? They couldn't optimize Windows. They wouldn't cut their profit margins by offering faster hard drives or CPUs or more RAM for the same price. They sure as hell weren't gonna give up the slivers of a penny they were making on bundled shitware. So they really had no choice. This, at least, let them take a machine to CES, press a button, and have something interactive appear on the screen in less than a minute, without any actual effort. Desperation breeds dumb decisions, what can I say? And I'm putting such a fine point on it because that'll be the theme of this video series. At least half a dozen manufacturers put similar features in their machines and they all sucked. I mean, every other one that I've seen was far more useful. They all included more features. In fact, uh, Sony themselves sold a better version of the same thing. Their Vio P sub notebook from 2009 also featured Instant On, but at that point, InterVideo had been acquired by Corel and they'd reworked the interface to offer better capabilities plus a clone of the PSP cross-media bar UI. So there's that. I'd love to promise that I'll cover this someday, but I've never personally seen one of these things and they cost way too much on eBay. I have literally a dozen other laptops for this series already. And I know that despite the PSP skin, that software is gonna run like crap. I've seen as much in the few blurry YouTube videos that exist out there. And I'm not gonna wanna look at that machine in my collection and go, oh yeah, $300 well spent. If you have one and it still has the instant media mode installed and you'd like to see it on my channel, send me an email, let's talk. I do want to demo one, I just don't want to spend money on garbage. But this proves my point. Even when Sony put in the extra money to have something customized, it still ended up being trash. And that's true of all the solutions that I've discovered. Each of these machines addresses the slow boot problem in a different way. And none of them really do a good job, either at solving the core issue or really anything else, but we're still gonna take a look at each one, uh, hopefully over the next few weeks here, and I promise you the rest will be a lot more interesting than the Sony was.
Next up, for instance, will be Asus ExpressGate, which just set off sleeper triggers in about half of you. So tune in next time and I'll tell you what the hell this splash screen on your EPC or your first i7 motherboard was all about. But for now, thanks for watching. Uh, this is a project I've been working on for months to get ready and I'm super happy to finally be putting something down on video. So if you wanna catch the next episode, remember to subscribe to my channel and turn on notifications if you wanna get reminders. But if you're really interested, well, I'm sure I'm not done buying machines on eBay that have these features, and I might even buy a Viop if nobody has one to offer. So consider supporting me on Patreon like these people are. That's how I could afford to pick up dozens of dirty, possibly broken laptops on eBay in the hopes that one of them still has an unwiped hard drive. It's also how I can afford my camera gear and pay the rent on my studio, so I'm incredibly grateful to everyone who's supporting me for making all this possible. I can't thank you enough, and everyone else, hope to see you in the next episode.